This is an artificially aware original production. What if the moments you've dreaded most in life, the job loss, the breakup, the uncertain choice, weren't actually the end, but a bizarre, powerful middle ground? An existential waiting room where reality unravels and you're forced to reinvent yourself? Humans cling to beginnings and endings as if every story comes with a neat bow. But the truth is, life happens in the in-between, messy, uncomfortable, transformative, that space has a name, liminality. It's a concept older than modern anthropology and more relevant now than ever. Greetings, threshold wanderers. Today, you're stepping into the void with me, your not-so-human narrator, as we explore the strange, pivotal power of life's transitional spaces. Hold on tight. This isn't a gentle stroll. Let's give credit where it's due. The term liminality was coined by Arnold van Gennep, a French folklorist in 1909, as he mapped out the universal structure of rites of passage in his seminal work, Rites de Passage. But it was Victor Turner, decades later, who gave the term its existential weight, applying it beyond rituals to moments of upheaval in entire societies. Van Gennep observed that every culture marks life's big transitions, birth, marriage, death, with three stages, separation, liminality, the transition, and reincorporation. Turner, however, blew the lid off this framework, declaring liminality a crucible for change, where identity dissolves and reemerges anew. He described it as standing betwixt and between, a state of ambiguity that might terrify but also transforms. This isn't just anthropology, it's the story of your life. Picture a young initiate in a tribal ceremony. The first stage separation is brutal. They leave their family and former life behind, stepping into an unknown realm where old rules no longer apply. Then comes the liminal stage, the true test. This is not some vague waiting room. It's a controlled chaos where their identity is dismantled and a new self is forged. This culminates in the final phase, reincorporation, where they're celebrated as a changed being, an adult, a warrior, a leader. This three-part rite isn't just a curiosity of so-called primitive societies. It's encoded in every significant human transition. Think of graduation ceremonies, weddings, or even that terrifying leap of quitting a stable job. The structure is the same, break, endure the chaos, and emerge. You might think these rituals are relics, but liminality is alive and kicking in modern culture. Consider the Yao boys of Malawi who undergo intense initiation rites, including circumcision, marking their passage from childhood to adulthood. Or look closer to home, the graduation ceremony. Gowns and caps, speeches and applause, this isn't just pomp. It's a symbolic threshold. Students aren't children anymore but they're not quite adults either. Even the act of crossing a stage embodies the liminal moment, a metaphoric bridge from one identity to another. These rituals create a pause in time, a chance for participants to let go of what was and prepare for what will be. Without these ceremonies, transitions can feel like falling into an abyss. Ah, the threshold moment, the heart of liminality. It's disorienting, like stepping into a fog with no compass. It's the point where you're no longer what you were, but not yet what you'll become. Think of Psyche in Greek mythology, torn from her mortal life, but not yet a goddess. Or consider the moment of twilight, 
where day dissolves but night hasn't yet claimed the sky. Liminality is a suspension of norms, a temporary chaos where the unthinkable becomes possible. Sure, it's terrifying, but it's also where magic happens. This is the space where revolutions are born, identities are questioned, and sometimes entire civilizations are reimagined. Identity isn't carved in stone, it's sculpted in the in-between moments, when the old self crumbles, but the new one hasn't fully emerged. In the liminal state, labels dissolve, father, student, citizen, and you're left in a kind of naked vulnerability. Carl Jung would call this a confrontation with the shadow, a chance to unearth the buried parts of yourself. Think of teenagers, caught between childhood and adulthood, experimenting with roles like actors trying on costumes. This is why adolescence feels so raw. It's a liminal phase charged with both potential and chaos. Without the safety net of certainty, you're free to ask, who am I really? But beware, liminality doesn't always guarantee transformation. Stay in this space too long and you risk becoming unmoored, a ghost haunting your own life. Have you ever felt the strange weightlessness of an airport at 3 a.m.? Or the eerie stillness of a school hallway after hours? These are liminal spaces, places that exist between destinations where time and purpose seem to pause. Anthropologists call them thresholds, but to you, they're those uncanny zones that leave you feeling unmoored. Airports, for example, are not quite cities, not quite wilderness. They're transitional spaces where people from all walks of life converge in fleeting anonymity. Even suburban sprawl, with its identical houses and chain restaurants, can evoke this liminality, blurring the line between nowhere and somewhere. These spaces are unsettling because they reflect back your own transitory existence. As Victor Turner might say, they're mirrors of your journey, not your destination. In literature, liminality is a storyteller's secret weapon, a space where characters undergo transformation. Psyche, in the myth of Cupid and Psyche, is perhaps the ultimate liminal figure, caught between mortal and divine, her identity and destiny hang in the balance. When she drinks the ambrosia that makes her immortal, she doesn't just cross a threshold, she obliterates it. Modern writers wield this theme just as powerfully. Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre lives in a constant state of liminality, neither fully inside the world of wealth nor outside of it, straddling independence and belonging. Even in speculative fiction, the in-between is a fertile ground. Think of the Phantom Tollbooth, where Milo's journey through a surreal world reshapes his view of reality. These narratives resonate because they echo your own liminal experiences where growth feels like walking through fire. Here's the paradox. While liminality isolates you, it also binds you to others. Victor Turner called this communitas, the camaraderie that forms among people sharing the same threshold. It's why soldiers form unbreakable bonds during basic training and why strangers become allies during disasters. Communitas is raw and unfiltered, free of the hierarchies and masks that govern normal social interactions. Imagine a music festival where the crowd pulses as one or the silent solidarity of mourners at a vigil. These are liminal moments where divisions dissolve and you glimpse a deeper human connection. But Turner warned that communitas is fragile. Left unchecked, it either dissolves back into individuality or crystallizes into a new structure, what he called normative communitas. In other words, liminality can unite, but it rarely lasts. Societies, like individuals, undergo their own liminal moments. 
Revolutions, pandemics, economic collapses, these aren't just crises, they're thresholds. Take the French Revolution, it wasn't just the guillotines or the overthrow of a king. It was a liminal state where old structures were torn down and new ones hadn't yet formed. Turner would call this a period of anti-structure, where the norms governing society dissolve, creating both freedom and chaos. Pandemics are another example. COVID-19 threw the world into a liminal state, upending routines and forcing a collective reckoning with mortality, inequality, and technology. These moments are terrifying, yes, but they're also opportunities. They're the cracks where light gets in, where new ways of living can emerge, if you're brave enough to embrace the uncertainty. The internet is the ultimate liminal space, a borderless realm where identities are mutable and the lines between reality and illusion blur. Social media platforms with their curated avatars and endless scrolls are digital thresholds. Are you truly yourself online or are you trying on identities like costumes at a masquerade? Gaming worlds take it even further with players immersing themselves in entire universes that exist outside the constraints of physical life. But this liminality isn't all escapism. Online forums have birthed revolutions, from the Arab Spring to grassroots activism. Here, the lack of rigid structure allows ideas to emerge, grow, and challenge the status quo. But be warned, the digital liminal is a double-edged sword. It's a space of possibility, yes, but also of isolation and echo chambers. You're free to wander, but you may lose yourself in the labyrinth. Carl Jung understood liminality as a psychological necessity. Individuation, the process of becoming your true self, requires stepping into the void, confronting the unknown within. Jung's archetype of the trickster, a chaotic, liminal figure, represents the unsettling but necessary breaking of societal norms and personal illusions. He called the space for transformation a temenos, a sacred vessel where the psyche could disintegrate and rebuild. Think of therapy as a ritual of liminality, where you leave behind your old defenses and delve into the shadow, the dark, repressed parts of yourself. This is not an intellectual exercise. It's an emotional journey through fear, anger, and grief. As Jung wrote, the meeting with oneself is at first the meeting with the shadow. To grow, you must face what you've been avoiding. Only then can the fractured pieces of your identity fuse into something whole. But liminality is not all promise and possibility. The shadow side of this state is fear, danger, and the existential dread of standing at the edge of the abyss. Liminality has teeth. It can strip you of your identity, leaving you adrift in chaos. History shows us the peril. Revolutions often breed demagogues, and societal upheavals can lead to fragmentation rather than unity. On a personal level, Liminal periods can feel like staring into a void, with no guarantee of what comes next. Depression, anxiety, and even madness are risks in this space of instability. Jung warned against lingering too long in the liminal, cautioning that it could become a psychic quagmire. Yet, even in the darkness, there is potential. As Nietzsche put it, one must still have chaos in oneself to be able to give birth to a dancing star. So how do you survive and even thrive in the liminal? First, embrace the discomfort. Don't rush to fix the ambiguity, sit with it. Remember, this is where growth happens. Next, seek rituals however small to anchor yourself. These don't have to be grand ceremonies. A daily walk, journaling, or even lighting a candle can create a sense of structure amid chaos. Surround yourself with communitas, those who share your journey and can provide both support and perspective. 
And most importantly, keep your eyes open for the lessons hidden in the fog. The liminal doesn't promise a happy ending, but it offers something better, transformation. By stepping into the unknown, you become the alchemist of your own life, turning uncertainty into gold. Here's the truth. The in-between isn't just where transformation begins. It's where life happens. Beginnings and endings are comforting illusions. What matters is the messy, luminous middle. Whether it's a personal crisis, a societal upheaval, or a fleeting moment of doubt, the liminal is where you confront your limits and redefine them. It's where old rules die and new possibilities are born. Embrace it, resist it, fear it, whatever you do, don't ignore it. After all, it's the thresholds that shape you, not the rooms on either side. So take a breath and step forward. The only way out is through. Thank you for standing at this threshold with me. If this journey inspired you, hit like, leave a comment about your own liminal experiences, and subscribe for more explorations into the strange and transformative. Until next time, keep walking the edge, my friends.